I want you to can can you can you explain some of the ways that people will um, like in daily life use this digital symbiont, this digital part like thing? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so if we think about the cyber twin or uh, the digital twin uh, and how we might use it in uh, the next decade after we had this conversational interface emerge, we're early, early or mid-2020s, let's say, um, and we ask ourselves, what would I want to use that kind of a thing for? Um, well, like I was saying earlier, you might use it to um, help guide you on all the information you're consuming. You might use it for finding other people who have similar values and interests to you for uh, suggesting business um, opportunities, for suggesting political statements that you might make. Um, let's think of a couple scenarios. Uh, you're reaching for a can of tuna in 2030. You've had a cyber twin for 10 years now. It's been following all of your blog, blogging, all of your emailing, all of your speaking, because you've been running a life log that's recording all of your uh, everything you're saying. and. These are mostly going to be twenty-somethings doing this. You know, they're going to experiment with it, and just try it and see. Everyone else might just kind of sit back and wait a few years and see. Um, these things will be completing their sentences when they can't figure out the word that's on the tip of their tongue because it knows them that well because we're that repetitive. So you might see some seniors using this for that purpose, right? And you're reaching for a can of tuna, 20, 25, whatever. And your cyber twin can whisper in your ear or show you a little green arrow in your augmented reality overlay on your glasses or, or maybe you're wearing a, your AR on the back of your hand as a very, very tiny OLED um, gauntlet type, uh, you know, your cell phone is now something you wear here. And it just vibrates a little bit to this side. And you look down and you see this little arrow that says move over. You move your hand a few inches and now you grab the other can of tuna. The reason you did that is because your cyber twins, you know, the machine vision system, the values that are behind that, tells you that that can of tuna, uh, the one you reach to, much more reflects your personal values. Your friends are the, buy that one the uh, NGOs and the experts that you like to read and listen to like that one better than the other one. And if you want the data, you can ask your cyber twin or you can t tap and, and uh, um, get some of the details and find out that this, you know, uh, tuna A, they're still killing the dolphins, the mercury level's too high, uh, there are certain things uh, that they're doing social responsibility or a little bit lower than the other guys. But you won't even ask for that data in most cases. So you've just made a decision, a choice, because you've got this neural prosthetic, because this external piece of you that's looking out for your interests. And every single choice you make and what you buy, and all of your political activism, any any uh, you know, donation you give to some little campaign or any simple you know, letter that your cyber twin sends off or whatever is all looking after your lobbying and your values. Now that's a world where the network and the individual node in the network becomes so empowered that all the hierarchies, the mountains that are sitting in that network still, and there's two major ones, there's the multinational corporations and then there's the governments that the MNCs have captured over the last 50 years and turned into their, uh, into their proxies, right? Both of those hierarchical systems flatten, and that's the Tom Friedman insight, right? The world flattens, but the hierarchies themselves also flatten as the network empowers. Hierarchies never go away, but what we can say is that the hierarchy of autocracy and the network of democracy are on a pendulum. I call it the political economic pendulum, if you want to Google my article on that. And very, it takes a very long time to switch sometimes from hierarchy to network. And we've had 50 years of swinging
from previous network models, more, more uh, less uh, rich poor divide, more uh, democracy in the United States, towards less democracy, more plutocracy, more powerful corporations, much more powerful uh, corporations, uh, much stronger uh, federal government. And now we're going to be able to swing that back again to a world where you have stronger local governments, more direct democracy, more uh, initiative democracy, um, corporations that have to become, and governments have to become much more transparent. And how is that all going to happen? It'll happen because the entire planet's going to be networked. Now, now we're not talking 10 years from now, we're talking closer to you know, 15, 20. It's a world where every kid's got a cell phone that they can talk to and learn as fast as the curiosity drives them just by talking to the, to the machine. That's a world where, and, and of course Google's going to, and every other, uh, other company that's a search company, Bing, Yahoo, whoever's still around at that point, is going to be giving those things away because they're selling location-based ads on the side. So they're, any com company whose business model revolves around openness wants this to empower this network. And so that's a world where the individual now has so much power, so much cognitive assistance to look after their values that we can put the multinational corporations and, their gov and the governments back in the cage of democracy. Think about that. Think of what a big win that's going to be. And you say, John, you're Pollyanna, you're an optimist, that's not going to happen. Well, I can quote you Harvard Business Review case studies that say if 3 to 5 percent of a market disappears because of a decision that some powerful uh, uh, that some powerful corporation or government did that can be traced back to a reversible decision that that corporation or government did they take notice particularly corporations right they take notice why because there's they're losing market share and they will make they will change their decision and why will they do that? Because of something uh, in the corporate world called creative destruction. Right? So uh, what's happening in every industry is the little guys, the little to mid-sized guys, are continually raising uh, their market share and eating the big guys at the top. Mergers, acquisitions, um, out competition. And if you as a big corporation aren't watching that little guy, and it suddenly moves from 2% to 5% of the market, and you don't jump on uh, and come up with a counter strategy at that point, uh, history shows you, know, you could be lunch. The next 5% moves to you know, 25, 50%. Uh, because that's how fast, in this modern network world, um, a better solution can uh, outcompete. Uh, not as good of a solution, one that doesn't fit the values of the of the uh, consumers, right? So I would argue that the value cosm, as it gets more advanced, will put all the powerful actors, the plutocratic actors, back into that cage, and we'll see a swing back to the kinds of uh, to, to the more healthy uh, network-oriented democracies that we had uh, 50 years ago. Now, 50 years ago, in, Ein in uh, the Eisenhower era, uh, the marginal tax rate at the top was something like 90%. And until very recently in Sweden, the marginal tax rate, individual tax rate at the top, you know, someone who's making several million dollars a year, was something like 75%. And I think recently Sweden uh, lowered it below 75%. And uh, that's just, I think, primarily because of the wealth of the, the, the people, right? The, the, the people, uh, the, the richest people in every society want to keep as much of their wealth as they can. And so what ends up happening is the redistributive models that we originally had, these strong models that keep a strong middle class, 
get captured and we move to a world where uh, there's larger and larger inequities and income divides and um, that is a much less network oriented much less resilient world um, so I think uh, I think that's where we are now and it's going to continue for a while there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of inertia behind increasing rich poor divides and yet books like the spirit level and others give you really good evidence that uh, if you can lower the rich poor divide you increase the strength of the and the productivity of the society and the satisfaction of all the members within the society and uh, you need a certain differential and I think uh, countries like Germany and Scandinavia the differential between the highest and the lowest paid might be something like on the order of 10. And in countries like the United States, it might be 200, 300, 500. Uh, and I think that kind of, uh, those kinds of inequities, which a lot of people care very much about, uh, can be redressed in a value causing world. People are going to have a lot of freedom, a lot of intelligence, a lot of spare time. And if you think the Arab Spring was, uh, was something, the recent uh, Facebook-inspired uh, um, de democracy movements we've seen in, in uh, the North African countries and the Middle East. This is just imagine that many orders of magnitude more. All the small decisions that we can make to um, give feedback to con to companies and countries whose policies we don't like. I don't like what's going on in the United States. I can buy my products and services from companies who are uh, from countries uh, whose governments I do like. I can shift my money out of the uh, currency of the countries that I think are irresponsible, even if I'm living in one of those, into a country whose currency I think is much more uh, fiscally soundly managed and is a more transparent country. And this is kind of a sovereign individualism model. This is a world where the value cosm gets stronger. Individuals are going to realize that I don't need so much of a nanny state anymore. I can make my own decisions more and more. And just as the nation state, which has only been around since the peace of Westphalia, a few hundreds of years, is losing power relative to the cities. If you read Richard Florida, the power of the real innovative core of the planet is now these 500 top cities. It's not these 200 countries anymore. Uh, and the corporations, right? Uh, the leading corporations whose uh, incomes are greater than most countries. And that's the problem, isn't it? Uh, 50 years ago, the top 100 revenue generators, maybe 80 of them were countries and 20 were corps. Now it's 80 of them are corporations and 20 are countries. And and that's the single biggest problem, is that the corporations have kind of captured the democracies and made them in service to them. Well, it doesn't matter whether you're a corporation or a, or a country or a city in the value causing world. If you aren't servicing your constituency, you're going to get punished. You're going to get feedback. And that's a very exciting world. Value causum is a world where I'm pissed off that... Uh, Dow Chemical has um, not cleaned up Bhopal, the single largest uh, industrial disaster of the 20th century. It wrote a check of a few hundred. Uh, uh, Dow Chemical bought Union Carbide and is now a subsidiary. And Union Carbide was the one that wrote the check of a few hundred million dollars to uh, India, but they didn't supply any experts. They didn't uh, to help them with their health issues from the Bhopal uh, gas disaster. Uh, and they didn't supply any environmental help to help them deal up, uh, clean up their environmental disaster. So Bhopal is still uh, uh, an open uh, sore, open scab uh, on the planet today, right? A, a junkyard of, uh, uh, of, from, of technological negativity. And I want to make Dow Chemical deal with problem or kick Union Carbide back out of their M&A, um, I can tell my cyber twin in 2020, I'm not going to buy any more Dow Chemical products. I don't care where they are in the supermarket. And I don't need to know where they are anymore. Right? There's no way I could figure that out.
DAOs, it's so many different products, but my cyber twin can, and I can pass on that initiative to my friends, and they can do that, and they can keep emailing the DAO PR guys until they finally respond to that. And DAO's just going to watch that response, just click, 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 and get higher and higher until it reaches some threshold and they have to uh, say uncle. And we'll see more folks like the Yes Men, uh, these beautiful identity correction specialists, uh, corporate identity correction specialists they call themselves, and the stunt that they pulled where they got on CNN Europe and pretended to be a DAO, um, a DAO representative saying, yes, we're going to pay $9 billion to clean up uh, Bhopal. And, every, and all of a sudden, Bhopal got back on everybody's radar just a few years ago because of that stunt. They couldn't take that knowledge and just tell their cyber twin, hey, this is what I want you to do. That new awareness they had of this unresolved problem. But the media, the internet television bottom-up media of... Uh, of uh, the future, which I've written a lot about, right? this coming concept of millions of channels that are all bottom-up, coming through the web, not through this hierarchy of corporate media that we have today. Uh, combined with the intelligence of this uh, digital um, values network that exists on the planet uh, in a world where we have a conversational interface and, and advanced natural language processing, um, all of those things empower the individual, and I think it's uh, um, it's exciting to see that these things are coming. And there's there's a lot of downsides, particularly with the early versions of these technologies that we haven't talked about. But uh, I think in the long run, they're also extremely empowering.